Hey everybody, today I'm going to be reviewing The Substance. This was directed by Coralie Fajot. Fajot is a French filmmaker and she's heavily influenced by a lot of American films, particularly, you know, the ones that are more pulpy, violent, and there's a brutality there that I think stuck with her. She's reminiscent to me of another French filmmaker that I'm quite a fan of, Julia de Corno, who made films like Raw and Titan. It's that tenacity that I think gives a movie like The Substance a lot more weight as an experience. Yes, it is meant to be voyeuristic, you know, like from the male perspective by design, but you know it is made by a, a woman and the point of view is meant to be a woman so there's something about the intimacy of that subject matter that I think resonates more deeply because of that it's the combination of like hard and soft that appeals to me it's like grit and gloss glitter and grease and the substance is only Farja's uh, sophomore feature and that makes this all the more exciting this is a very abrasive film uh, it made a big splash at the Cannes Film Festival a lot of Oscar buzz for uh, Demi Moore I really liked this film. I, I think this is another winner we have here. I felt immersed in this film in ways that I normally do not, and I would say my theater, I think it got quite a stirring reaction from the audience in ways that I normally don't experience, and, and that was enjoyable. I mean, there was a lot of applause, laughter at certain points, some um, gasps, and you could feel discomfort often. It was it was fun. If you've seen the trailer for this film, which I do think is, is very well done, you'll know that this is a body horror uh, type of film that is about kind of like a Jane Fonda aerobics instructor type of celebrity, and this is played by uh, Demi Moore. She's turning 50, so they want to replace her with somebody younger. You know, her time is up, as is typical, particularly in the industry that she's in. It's going to uh, magnify all of that. And yes, you know, when a woman hits 35, 40, it's, it's a huge wake-up call, especially when you allow that natural objectification that comes with being a woman to define your entire identity. But at the same time, admittedly, it's hard not to fall into those traps when the world constantly reminds you of that objectification. You know, that's the only thing that seems to matter in culture. But yeah, it's like 50, gotta kick this old hag to the curb. But you know, I think that idea, especially explored in this way, is really refreshing because we don't often see it acknowledged the way that women, you know, when they, when they're, you know, beyond their, their baby making years, it's like, where do they find that purpose? Whereas a man can continue to thrive in that area, he can play the field a lot more easily so long as his uh, equipment is functional. And so it's that, you know, that dichotomy, I think that is, yeah, again, it's, it's refreshing here. We see a lot of girl boss kind of feminist movies, but again, this is a darker side that I find to be, you know, so much more interesting. Demi Moore's character here is, yes, you know, she's feeling alone, she's feeling sad, and, you know, she's needing to find purpose in that third act of her life. She comes across this unknown, very sketchy drug called the substance, and uh, she injects it into herself, and it's meant to unlock this new younger, more idealized version of herself. And this younger person is basically birthed, you know, out of her back in this very, like, Cronenbergian style. Now, the younger idealized version of the self is played by Margaret Qualley. There are specific rules, though, when you use this substance. Like, you know, when the younger version is awake, when she's conscious, the older version has to be unconscious. So, uh, when Quali is, you know, doing her thing, she basically shoves uh, Demi's character just like into this dark room and she just kind of lays there for seven days. But that's the key to this. You can roam around so long as you're back to make the switch in seven days. So it's like an alternating sort of thing. But they make this very apparent that both of these, these characters, they are both two sides of the same coin, essentially. They are two halves of a whole and so they constantly have to remain in balance. Otherwise, this experiment fails. They have to make the switch every seven days without exception or hijinks will ensue. I know it sounds strange, maybe even convoluted, but I promise the way that it's done in the movie, it's very straightforward. They do a, a very good job of making it perfectly clear with minimal dialogue, and yet there is like a humor to the blatancy of everything. What I love about this movie is it's very simplistic as a story, and it's like everything is meant to be surface level, and yet you can pour into the broader edges of things something maybe a little rougher. Perhaps the intimacy and pain of what it means to be a human being. This is an existential crisis of sorts. I see this movie as being about, you know, experiencing all the facets in one life cycle, but filtered through the fragments of modern culture, particularly Hollywood. And, you know, like, like the whole Snapchat and Instagram filter thing, Kim Kardashian, Ozempic, all of that fuses together into this squishy, squirming, wriggling sort of thing, and it distorts into the most explosive climax, pun intended. And it's very emotionally effective, as I said. I think, you know, any woman who at some point in her life has experienced maybe a bad eating disorder or bad body dysmorphia, 
absolutely understands kind of the nightmarishness distortions of this. Anyone who's had maybe an acid trip where maybe they look in the mirror when they shouldn't have and it's like they see themselves turning into an old person and it's like they, they experience the inevitability of their life cycle and that can be really powerful. And there's also that resonant feeling of like that awkward you know, moment of when you have a first date and it's that self-torture of it's like, you know, I want to look my best. I'm trying on all these different outfits. I'm doing my makeup and taking it off. I'm doing my hair up and I'm taking it down. It's that uncomfortable vulnerability in this movie, again, that I think anybody can understand, but we just don't want to think about it. This is movie is about no longer being passive when it comes to how you feel about yourself, how you feel about the way you look or think. It is about suddenly becoming angry and vicious and bitter as youth is slipping through your fingers. And there's a, there's a jealousy, a frustration where it grows so violent that yes, we are ripping at our skin, ripping at the tight clothes and the makeup and the hair. Women can be ferocious. And I think that this film uh, personifies the feeling of the rip very well. I mean, this movie just has a ripping sort of feeling in the smallest, most grotesque details to, you know, the most overblown, most operatic, nightmarish aspects. This film is like a mix of like that trashy black humor you get from something like Showgirls, the more drug-induced horror of a movie like Requiem for a Dream, mixed with like the extreme psychedelic horror of like Akira or, you know, even like David Cronenberg. I never felt like the movie though was losing its point of view or losing its confidence even with all of these different references. It's using all of these fragments of other things to build something that is unique and refreshing. And I also never got the feeling that this movie was anti-men in the way that I, I normally feel, nor did I think that this movie was trying to victimize women unfairly compared to how uh, I normally feel about things. I think this movie sees the deep flaws and ugliness in women behind the velvet curtains. It's more interested in what makes somebody obsessive and hateful and jealous, delusional and incapable of having, having any sort of connection, anything real. And the main character, it's so interesting because it's like she is gorgeous obviously for her age, but she's in amazing shape. She's obviously rich. So it's like, even though she's losing her job here, it's not like she has to file for unemployment or anything. And she has several opportunities here where she could actively change her life and take new pathways that yes, might be different, but it could lead to a new form of happiness for her. And yet they all tragically falter. And this is often, you know, due to her own neurosis that limits her. But the pulpy dressing of the film compared to like that architectural illusory way that we're exploring the character, there's a lot of hallways and that sort of thing in this movie. It reminded me of Strange Darling, which is another movie that's one of my favorite films of the year. Both films have a heart, in particular this one has a gluttony that I kind of enjoy, but a carnal energy that is just I desperately want. Another thing that I love about this premise is that, you know, they could have gone the route like the dark fairy tale route where you have like this ugly witch who's never been beautiful before and it's like she's granted a witch to become like this beautiful princess or something. It's like no, this is about a woman who she is beautiful. She's still beautiful. Um, she's lived her whole life being a beautiful woman. I mean, yeah, she knows what it means to be pampered and spoiled and adored. And thus she knows how much easier it is at a certain point in your life in certain aspects. But what's most interesting to me, at least, about the Quali character is that, like Demi's character, it's like she's at a certain point in her life cycle and it's like she knows that she's beautiful now, but she knows that she won't always be. So she's trying to live in the moment because young people always feel like they are immortal. So it's like it's like the idea of abusing the substance in ways that maybe she's not supposed to in order to stay beautiful, stay admired for just a little bit longer. But that reminds me of, yes, like the aimless energy of, of young people who are, yes, they're like drunk, destructive, partying all the time. And it's like, you know, they don't care about what happens to them later because they're very like, yeah, I'll pay for it when I'm older, YOLO. I think this is the type of movie that can affect you, yeah, depending on your age, depending on where you are in your own timeline. For example, I honestly think that the emotional impact of this movie would have been quite different for me maybe five years ago when I was in my 20s compared to now when I'm in my 30s and I'm sure it will be much different, you know, in my 40s and, you know, beyond. I couldn't help but think about, like, the generations of women in my family. I, I think about my grandmother as an example and seeing pictures of her when she was young and she was beautiful and, like, like sexy and all of these things, but it's like, I never knew that woman, at least visually. But yes, it is those feelings that just feel palpable in the movie, right on the surface. But I will say, I do have a few issues with the film, uh, particularly in the second half. You know, I, I think the whole the whole premise of like the seven day switch. It's great, but at a certain point, it starts to get repetitive and a little bit 
numbing. And only because I don't think we're exploring our characters and the ideas as much as we need to with each switch so that the momentum builds in a way where it's it's got a nice flow. There's no fabric puckering. When the outcome for your character is pretty much inevitable, so you don't build the inner world and the outer world, it just, it kind of deflates the tension a little bit. Also, I am a little bit torn on the third act, but not in the ways I normally am. I will just say right off the bat, I enjoyed the third act. It's, uh, it's memorable. It's a fun time. I applaud the boldness of it, and I love that they're just taking that excess and shooting it through the roof with, with confidence, and it never feels like it doesn't work within the context of things. Like I said, it got a huge reaction in my theater, and um, yeah, I mean, I was entertained by it, and I think it's hard not to be on a basic level, but I'm just not sure how I feel about things growing into like this more operatic climax that is honestly very reminiscent of something like carry. This film to me is so much about the internal experience that distorts the outside world, whereas in carry there's such a combination of internal and external. So it's like in that one the payoff in that climax really works where you just want to see bitches die. Whereas this one just feels a little bit detached from a lot of those initial nuances that did catch my interest. It's like we're slicing and dicing our way to the center of the Tootsie Roll and I don't think you need to do that. We can be a little more delicate about it and just chisel away at the center. Yet at the same time I, I want to see this climax again. I want to see the whole film again multiple times just because I could see myself possibly really getting into more the melodramatic horror at the end, especially how it becomes so subversive. Especially when you consider, even in the midst of all of these insane body fluctuations and all of that, there is still this inherent, desperate human need to survive, despite it all. Like I've said, I don't think it's, you know, thematic ideas that are super deep which make this movie interesting. It's more kind of like the abstract feeling and how this movie pours in so many raw primal experiences in a fake world. I admit, oftentimes when I see movies that are meant to convey the female experience, they often feel too soft or too one note. And, you know, maybe that's just me, just my personal experience. I like something a little darker, a little more complex that represents more my experience. But no, Farjaj, you know, she's not some princess. She's got some dirt underneath her fingernails and she's got some fire and aggression in her soul and she doesn't feel afraid of exploring all of that and so I am so excited to see what she comes up with in the future. This is fantastic. And that is my review. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm going to plug my website as always. It is deepfocuslens.com. I'm an artist. I do commission portraits and I sell prints of my work. If that is something that you're interested in, you can always go to the website below. And if you have a question about a commission or a print, you can always email me. My email is in the description box below as well. Also, I'd like to give a shout out to my patrons who are great. Guys, thank you so much for your support. Welcome to all the new members. If you are interested in supporting, the link for that is below as well as the rest of my social media information. You can watch more videos here and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.